Oh yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, Joe Grant, how many people went to his workshop? Sweet, yeah, he went. Uh, <laughs> so Joe made the Optic Spy. This was a project that just shipped like a week or two ago, two weeks ago. Um, so everyone who ordered one got theirs. We have a bunch here. Joe did an awesome workshop with it, with the Tomu, which you all got. Uh, and now he's gonna kind of give a rundown of, of what it's all about, not in workshop form, but, but uh, kind of overview the process and, and where it's going. Uh, Joe is a security researcher here in town. He travels all over the world. He's usually on an airplane, it seems like, uh, talking to agencies and, and companies and whatnot. Um, we're very lucky to have him as an advisor to Crowd Supply, and he's been a, a great help that way. Um, and he's going to lay it down. Thanks, Joe. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Please, no applause. Thank you, <laughs> Alvaro. <laughs> it's always fun to have a classroom full of people I know, and uh, but also very intimidating at the same time. So I expect, I, I expect heckling and other things. Um, yes, thank you for coming. My name is Joe Grand, and uh, we're going to talk about the Optic Spy project. Like Josh mentioned, um, I come from a hacker background, uh, but I also come from an engineering background. I've had sort of an interesting path of breaking systems and breaking into systems and doing all sorts of things that I shouldn't have done um, and then turning that into a career. So now I actually get to travel around and teach people about breaking hardware products, how to design things securely. Um, but I've always had a passion for electronics as well. Uh, so being a, a hardware guy in sort of the hacker world was weird for a long time until probably, I don't know, a handful of years ago where now IoT makes hardware cool. Uh, and I've always you know, built projects out of magazines and done stuff um, related to electronics and hacking, and I just put a few of the fun things here. Um, I, I stuck Chumbi up here. Some of you guys might be familiar with Chumbi, which is one of the first open source hackable products um, that I worked on with Bunny. So I put that here in honor of Bunny, who gave our keynote uh, yesterday. Um, this picture here you can't really see, but this sort of chronicles my path of computers. And um, I was reviewing the slides yesterday, and my son said, Daddy, I want to see your slides. Like, What are you going to talk about? And um, I didn't hide this one. He goes, oh, police. I go, oh, that's just a funny picture from a while ago. <laughs> and, then, and then my wife later was like, I can't believe you showed that to him. I'm like, oh. He saw it. I couldn't hide it. So anyway, he'll eventually know the whole story. Come on in. The other Joe from Portland is here. So um, yeah, so some, you know, sometimes I teach, sometimes I design stuff. And it's just I've always been passionate about building projects. A lot of times it's most of the time, actually I would say all the time, it's building projects that I think are fun and things that excite me. Uh, and then sometimes they turn into products that get manufactured and sold by other people. Sometimes they're just open sourced and not manufactured or whatever it is. It's just stuff I like sometimes turns into something. Um, so it's sort of related to this project, Optic Spy um, and Optics, a long time ago, I was also curious about like, what can you do with light and optics? And like, I'm more of an embedded systems kind of digital hardware guy. So anytime I get a chance to experiment with analog stuff is sort of fun. Um, so this was something I did when I was just 18, uh, trying to build a system that would shine a laser at like a window and the window would vibrate and reflect the laser back and then you could listen. So you could like spy on people in conference rooms and everything. And I had uh, a, an article made by a company called Information Unlimited that does all sorts of cool electronic projects and like, you know, subversive spy gear. And I had that project, but that was like all discrete transistor based. And I was a freshman in college and I was like, well, how come we can't use integrated circuits instead? Like get rid of all those, you know, little transistors. So I did, you know, had a 741, a 386, and, um, amplifier and it sort of worked, but not really. Um, I had to turn the stereo up like super loud and uh, then I could just barely hear something, but it was a fun way to sort of experiment with optics. Um, the way that this project came about, besides that sort of just general curiosity, is um, because of some of my work in doing hardware hacking stuff, I had been thinking a lot about optical covert channels. And this is something where, you know, a lot of the security field is talking about just physical access, like, like Joe had talked about earlier of, you know, it, once you get physical access to a product, it's pretty much compromised. Um, but there's other things on products that could be used for ways of either compromising or in some other malicious way. Um, so components on a piece of hardware, like LEDs, could be used. If you blink them really fast, you can send data out of them and the human eye can't see them. Um, I read a paper a handful of years, actually probably about 10 years ago, and then remembered it when I started getting back into this stuff. Um, this information leakage from optical emana uh, emanations um, paper from 2002, which is sort of like the seminal work of optical covert channels, where these researchers 
found a bunch of actual off the shelf products, modems, network devices, things like that, where the status indicators or like this, you know, the send data light or the receive data light, whatever different lights on the front panels were actually directly correlated to the data being sent. So a modem, if it's sending data out, the LED for that status line was tied directly to the data line. So sort of a, you know, quick and dirty engineering approach of like, well, why do we, you know, we don't need an extra IO pin. Let's just tie it to the data line. Um, but they're leaking information. So they sort of proved that concept. And I just thought that was so cool because everyone's focused on, you know, hacking Linux IOT devices with various, you know, um, through debug ports and all sorts of stuff that, that we talk about all the time. But a simple LED, right? It's like so cool. It's just light and you're sending data. So I don't know. It's just something like that really just excited me. Um, and there's been some other more recent work as well uh, showing how you could do malicious, have malicious devices send information. So I really wanted with this project to create something that was easy to experiment with and say, are there products out there that do this? Or let's create our own little light communication channel or whatever it is. So, you know, just something, something fun. Just like anything else we work on, like we're never the uh, um, innovators, I would say. You know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and we're, we're basically making little iterations of other people's work. And if we forget that, we lose a lot. And there's a lot of history we can learn from. So, you know, with this work, uh, some people are like, oh, I've already done that. I can flash lights on a product or whatever. But it's, you know, we're taking little steps to do things slightly differently and reach a different crowd and, and expose more people to different techniques. So just because one person did it once doesn't mean it makes it obsolete and no one should do it anymore. Um, so if we think about it, way before anybody was into transmitting things over light, one guy was Alexander Graham Bell made the photo phone in 1880. So anything we, we think that we do that's new and novel now, uh, we're a little bit behind, a little bit behind the times. So his little photo phone was using sunlight reflected onto a mirror. Um, very similar actually to what I tried to do with the laser laser listener is one person talked, uh, which then vibrated the mirror and then there'd be a receiver on the other side that would receive the vibrations and then turn that back into sound. Uh, he actually said that this was, a more significant invention, or he thought it was a more significant invention than the telephone, uh, but turns out just was a little bit ahead of its time and it didn't work on cloudy days and things. So it had some, you know, environmental um, issues, but that's the thing is, you know, anything we do is building on this stuff. So it's just super cool. Um, I think it's amazing that what, what, a hundred and I can't do math, 150 years ago, almost, you know, it's like, we're just doing a higher tech version of the same sort of thing, which is so cool. Um, and of course, fiber optics came out around 1963. I think the first prototypes were starting to actually send data through light, not just sending light through light. Um, and now we see things like optical networking systems. So uh, installations like Li-Fi or VLC is visible light communication systems that intentionally are networks that are using light transmission. So light bulbs or different fixtures and facilities or whatever. And we're starting to see that more. I just read an article last night of somebody saying VLC is the future because we can have um, data transmitted from the headlights of cars received by the taillights of cars in front to like have them communicate for space and things for autonomous vehicles. So using light is like, it's actually like pretty awesome. So the whole point of this was to, you know, make a project that people could use to start experimenting with stuff, with this stuff. It's not super high tech as you'll see. Um, but that's not the point. The point is to just have an easy tool as that starting point, that stepping stone, and then you can, you know, dive more into it if you want. Um, like most of my tools, open source, uh, and I wanted to have off the shelf components, something easy to, easy to, to build on your own. So no tiny things. Um, I have a mini USB connector there, much to the chagrin of many people <laughs> who are in the workshop. Um, but also a much easier part to solder than a micro USB. So I took that into account when I'm building stuff because I hate having to deal with, you know, the chip scale packages and tiny QFN things if I don't have to, right? So there's a lot of um, bigger parts on here. Um, I also like building stuff that has an easy to understand theory. Uh, so this is a project that is very, straightforward in the process. And I like that as an educational tool. There's another project I built a while ago that was a laser rangefinder, And there's so many different ways to do range finding with time of flight and all this stuff. Um, but it was sort of 
there's all these different complex ways. So the way I did it was a little bit laughable um, where I had a CMOS camera and a laser and it was doing triangulation. But to explain that is much easier when you're doing some trigonometry to figure out distance. Like that's an easy thing. So I really like that. Uh, and, and a goal with, again, with a lot of my stuff is to just inspire other people, raise awareness of what can be done uh, with, with, with things. And just think about like electronics doesn't have to be wireless communication, doesn't have to be network communication. It can be light, it could be sound, it could be temperature. There's all these other things. So Optic Spy is what we'll talk about and I'll sort of go through the development process, a little bit of the details and then give some demos and that will be, uh, that will be it. So Optic Spy is an optical receiver that will convert light into voltage and there's this giant photo diode on the front and a few stages of amplification and a comparator and a USB interface at the end. Uh, and we'll talk about all of those. This particular project, uh, I had been ex experimenting with optical covert channels kind of on my own and actually have a, have a workshop that I was teaching um, that let students kind of build their own little receiver and kind of mess around with it. But it wasn't, it wasn't a very easy to use thing. It needed some extra components. And I met with Josh from Crowd Supply and he's like, hey, we should do something like that for teardown, like have these things. And oh, we have this new thing called Tomu that has an LED on it. Like maybe we can do some workshop. And that's really how this particular version of the project started, uh, is make a user-friendly version of this light to digital converter that will do something and inspire people. Uh, it turns out that with the photodiode, we can receive not only infrared light, which a lot of the photodiodes are tuned just for infrared, this can do visible light as well. And that's what's really awesome because if you see a light, that appears just to be on, but it's actually sending data, like that's way more of a, like sort of a mind screw than like infrared, which you can't see anyway. Um, can handle different speeds, way faster than most of the stuff that, that we end up sending. Um, there's some potentiometers that we can adjust the gains and settings. So if we have a particular target that we're trying to mess around with. So, you know, again, just a general, kind of general purpose optical receiving tool. There's also some test points along the way, which I'll show you that you can tap in on any stage of the process. So if you want to tap earlier than certain things to in, input into other circuitry or whatever, you can do that. So here's the proof of concept. Um, when I was first building this stuff, I had a little LED with a, I think I was using a PIC. Yeah, I had a PIC that was just sending out random numbers that I was using for a different project. So printable ASCII random numbers. And you can see it was actually kind of blinking a little bit. Um, and, I, and here I have a little digital receiver. So this wasn't even the analog version. This was a precursor to that, where it's a digital receiver used for um, optical transmissions that was expecting UART data, NRZ encoded data. So here I have my receiver and my transmitter just proving like, oh, when I put the thing on, I can transmit some data. And that was like the first thing where I go, okay, now I can turn this into something useful. So here's some early versions of the, of the project. I was working on a d digital one and then the analog ones after. Uh, so I had built a few different versions. I ended up finding uh, an application note from Maxim, which uh, was called, actually it's on the next slide. I can't remember the exact name, but it basically showed how to do a high speed data receiver uh, for fiber optics. So I took that and kind of modified it, but I built a prototype of it. This is sort of the standard process of like, you have your schematic, um, you know, build up a breadboard of your system. That way you can change components and move things around and make sure it works before you end up sending boards to Osh Park and getting them, you know, getting prototypes made. Uh, so this was, this was the ultimate version of the, of the breadboard prototype before I made uh, a board or had the different transistors cause they're SOT 23. So here I put them on little, little carrier boards, put them onto the, uh, breadboard and, and wired everything up. The first version of this actually, I didn't have potentiometers. So I had a fixed gain for each of the stages. And uh, then a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you put pots there so you can actually change the gains? I'm like, that's amazing. So, you know, it's like even something simple, just having, having feedback from somebody else was like that. And that changed the game because now it made it a more general purpose tool than just for my particular class that I was putting this together for originally. So yeah, here's a digital version. Um, here's the first analog version, which used a different photodiode with the fixed, fixed uh, gains. And then here's my prototype with a different diode. It's the same board, different diode, and then different gains with the pots and stuff. And then once I knew that worked and Josh saw that, then we ended up doing the, the final one. Here's the block diagram. Very simple, little power supply circuit. Um, photodiode converts the, the light to current, ultimately into a voltage, which I'll talk about, um, and then into two stages of amplification, threshold detector, detector to basically determine, because we're taking analog in, we want to determine what is a logic one, what's a logic zero. 
And then what's cool is that gets shoved into a serial USB adapter, which not only powers the optic pi, but if we're dealing with uh, data streams that a serial USB adapter supports, like NRZ encoded data from a UART interface, then we can just use this thing as a straight receiver. We don't need anything else. So that's sort of the easy plug and play. There's gonna be times if we're encountering a system where it's not sending data that a serial USB adapter supports, we can tap on before it gets there with one of the test points and hook that up to a logic analyzer and just see the digital you know, data that is received and then analyze that separately. But this just makes it easier if we wanna hook it up directly to a host computer if we know what data we're transmitting over light and then we can easily put together a, a, a communication stream. So here's the board, looks almost exactly like the block diagram. We have our front end, our gain adjustments, threshold voltage. Uh, here we can select the polarity of the signal. So if we're creating our own system, we'll probably know what, you know, idle high or idle low. But if we're going around like, oh, I wonder what light is being sent from these things, you know, infrared things or motion sensors or LEDs on control boxes and whatever, we might need to change that. So this is just a, a simple way to invert the data. Um, to save you from having to do it, say, in software or something. And then our USB interface, it's an FT231X, um, and then the USB uh, output. I have two LEDs on here. One is for power to make sure that the board is working, and then a little receive indicator. So if we are actually receiving data, whether it's data or, or noisy, you know, light environment, whatever, we see something. So even if we don't have the terminal program set up or anything like that, we can still see if we're seeing data. And that's like, oh, now let's go figure out what it is. So here's the entire schematic. Um, I have shorter, you know, close-up views that we'll, that we'll go through, but there's really not much to it. Our little power supply is down here. USB to serial interface up here, all very standard. Uh, and then, you know, photodiode, front end, amplification, going to comparator, inverter, and then back. So just, I like a very kind of simple process along the way. And it was fun to experiment with analog stuff. I learned a lot. Uh, about op amps and about comparators and about bias voltages and all sorts of things. And I'm definitely not an expert, but it really is like, oh, it's kind of cool how, you know, there, a lot of thought goes into every little component. Every section of the board is like, engineers really have to think about a lot of different things just to get a product working. And a product working reliably in volume is a whole other story. Here's the board uh, without parts, obviously. Um, you can see the test points on the back, so of the different stages of the, of the process, um, which is kind of cool. So you can kind of tap on there on the front side also. Uh, and I have a black matte circuit board, which, you know, from doing optical things, I was like, well, we should use the matte version so it's not shiny, so it will reduce reflections from ambient light and everything. And it's not, it probably doesn't really help because the, the photodiode is facing that way anyway. But I thought it was like, go with the whole photo, you know, optical theme. Um, of black mat. So yeah, I thought the boards came out pretty awesome. So the different stages, the, the photodiode is the front end. I'm using a Vichet uh, BPW21R. The only bummer with this part is if you want to make like a one-off, they're $12 each or something like that. So um, some people say, oh, it's too expensive. And it sort of is, but like it's, it's a bummer, but it's also a great part. Uh, so when, when people say, well, why is the optics buy, I don't know how much they're selling on crowd supply. Why is it $49? It's like, because the diode itself is that big. And then, you know, somebody at least wants to make a dollar along the way. Uh, but it's a really cool diode that actually, um, the, the sensitivity of the diode mimics the human eye. And that's what makes it different than normal photodiodes that are more IR. And if you compare a sensitivity chart from an IR one, it doesn't look like this. Here's like the, the eye human eye looks like this, and then the diode looks like this. So it's actually even more sensitive to, to light that the human eye can't see, which is the infrared regions, uh, which means we can do visible light and infrared, and it's pretty cool. Um, and I think the peak is somewhere, it's like 550 nanometers, which is, I thought I had it written down, I think it's yellow or something, which, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it's yellow. I could be wrong. Um, so... Here's the, here's the front end circuitry. I have the, um, the photodiode here, reverse biased, and this is in what's called photoconductive mode. Um, you can also have a trans impedance mode where sometimes the photodiode is reverse biased, sometimes it's the other way, and you have uh, um, the current that it creates when light shines onto it going directly into a current to voltage converter, which is the trans impedance amplifier, an op amp. Um, but that was sort of like, ah, that's 
complicated um, and the application node actually that I was using had it this way. So I was like, okay, how can I figure out how this, how this actually works, what it's doing? Um, so yeah, photo diodes reverse biased. Um, we have our bias resistor down here. That's sort of the, lo the load resistor. Um, and when this generates a current, this ends up being a uh, resistor divider. And we can adjust sort of the, the gain of that stage by changing R2, and that's going to change the voltage because it's E equals I times R. Um, so current's going to flow this way. When light shines on here, current's going to flow this way proportional to the amount of light. Uh, and then going through the load resistor or the bias resistor, and then we have our voltage coming out. So it's just exactly math. E equals I times R. Um, and you'd be surprised. It took me quite a while to actually find a reference to um, like a data sheet or something that talked about the different ways of working with photodiodes. I don't know if everybody just assumes that that's what it is. But when I finally found, this was from a sharp uh, photodiode data sheet. It's like, oh, okay. So that's how the current gets converted to a voltage is just a simple, you know, E equals I times R. And um, that was like, oh, duh. And it's cool. Um, but there's some downsides to doing, to doing reverse bias um, and some upsides as well. The, the upside is that when you do that, you get a faster response. So you can deal with higher speed signals. And what I didn't want to do is limit the signal because we if we're just doing experimentation, we don't know what the speed is going to be. So we don't really want to miss anything. So try to do something fast, um, which is pretty cool. So a faster response means higher bandwidth, which means we can deal with higher speed signals. Um, I was actually surprised to see that this circuit could go up to one and a half megahertz. I would have been happy with like in the kilo, in the hundreds of kilohertz range if we're doing like say 115.2 kilobits a second of UART transmission or something. But uh, 1.5 megahertz is pretty cool. Um, but the trade-off to that is we, we're operating faster. We have less sensitivity, which means you can't go further away from the light. You have to be closer to the light because the sensor just isn't as sensitive when it's in the reverse, reverse bias mode. So that's sort of a downside. But generally, I would imagine you're sort of walking around with it and you're close to things anyway. So the distance part isn't as much of an issue. And to me, I would rather have it faster and be closer. You could probably add some optics on the front end to do something. One of the, one of the guys in the, uh, in the workshop a few days ago was like, oh, I could put this inside of like a rifle scope and then get really long range magnific or, uh, you know, whatever optical magnification of the, of signals from further away, which would be pretty cool. So that's the, that's the front end. Once we get our voltage, that's directly correlated to the light coming in plus our bias resistor. Um, that's our first stage. Our first stage gain is actually just R2, which is the, the value of the resistor or the potentiometer. Um, then we go through two stages of amplification and they're both non-inverting. And the reason of doing two is then you can, you have less gain per stage, but the benefit is less overall noise. If you have a giant gain on one amplifier, if you have a tiny bit of noise, then it's going to amplify. Um, but with two, you can have lower gain, so you have less of you know, signal to noise issues, uh, and then you can have uh, just a better overall signal. What we're also doing is we have a little bit of kind of signal massaging in between the two different op amps, and that's basically to, we have a bypass cap there to, or a decoupling cap um, to get rid of the offset voltage of the first input stage. But then what ends up happening is because you have that capacitor there for long signals that have like a fixed high or fixed low level, those end up drooping over time as the capacitor kind of discharges. So we have this RC, um, RC time constant here. Uh, so we have to sort of deal with that. And that, that is what sets our, our slowest possible data rate, which ends up being, I think, 100 hertz or something like that, which is still reasonable. Um, but yeah, so two stages, both are adjustable gains. And then the overall total gain is, you know, the first stage resistor and then the gain of each other stage. So it can be actually end up being pretty large gain uh, if you need to. And the gain, you'll end up like with the ones that we have just out of the box, everything's set at halfway. Uh, so the documentation that I wrote, little, a little product brief about it, I think it's 24 million. I don't remember the exact gain, but, you know, everything at half. Um, and then our, our threshold voltage is a little bit, a little bit higher above, above midway point. Um, so out of the box, you, you can probably work with most signals, but if you're dealing with something that's like a really dim signal uh, or maybe something that's really strong or maybe you have lots of ambient light that you need to reduce the gain, you can do that. But generally, you don't really have to do that unless you're you know, really focused on something. 
Um, I'll show you oscilloscope screenshots of all this stuff, by the way, as you know, when, as so you can see what it looks like through the stages. Um, but the comparator takes in the analog signal and is just going to compare it to some threshold voltage that's adjustable with R12 potentiometer. So yeah, by default, the threshold voltage is, is at two and a half volts. So if the signal is above two and a half volts, it gets treated as a logic level one. If it's below, it gets treated as a zero. That way you can deal with any noise at the top or bottom um, or any of the drooping that might happen for certain signals. On the output, you'll get a nice, you know, nice square wave or a nice data stream that hopefully matches what you're capturing on the, on the input. Here's a little you know, standard little transistor um, NPN inverter if you want to switch the signal, you know, switch the polarity of the signal. And then TP5 is that output there. So if we didn't want to pass that into the USB to serial adapter, we could just tap on here, see the signal, put it in our, put it in our Arduino or Pocket Beagle or you know, whatever other product um, logic analyzer and see the signal. Then the final stage is the USB interface. So data comes in and then data goes out to the USB interface. Virtual COM port uh, should work with any operating system. Um, this USB to serial adapter, the FT, FTDI parts, the FT231X, um, a lot of people have used the FT232s as well. This ends up being surprisingly cheaper. I think it's like half the price, the 231X. Uh, expects asynchronous data streams with NRZ encoded data, non-return to zero, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so if it doesn't see that, you'll just receive noise and whatever as it's trying to decode say a modulation scheme that is not NRZ. So having this is only good when you're dealing with, with systems that you know is transmitting the right type of thing. But it's really convenient when, uh, when it happens. Here's our bill of materials. Not too much stuff, you know, mostly just discretes. Uh, 100 piece quantity, $40, which is not cheap. But then you think about how much, how much crowd supply is charging them for, like that's a bargain. You don't have to do any work, and you already get one that's assembled. Everything's from DigiKey and Mouser. Um, yeah, the main things, photodiode, like I mentioned. The op amps were like 2 or $3 each. I could probably go with cheaper op amps or something, but I just went with the ones that were in the reference design. Seemed to make sense. Uh, and yeah, you know, as you would expect, sort of the main parts. And then discretes, not so much. And the fab assembly, I think, was 7 or $8 to fab assemble test each board or something. But yeah. No, no real surprises there. For the demos that I put together, and when I first started this sort of proof of concept thing, there's been a lot of academic papers about the optical covert channels and sending information over light and all this stuff. And a lot of them are like, well, we created our own encoding scheme to work at longer distances, or we uh, you know, wanted to work in outdoor environments to deal with fog and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, how, how come we can't just use existing encoding schemes like a UART interface? And instead of just sending a signal over a wire, let's just put an LED there instead. Uh, and it turns out it actually worked. So I don't know if, if you know, people are just overthinking the process or if they're trying to get it working in certain environments, but for our purposes, we can just stick an LED if, if a product doesn't already have an LED you know, and just use that to transmit information. So for, for UART interfaces, which is what we're using as our sort of demo proof of concept stuff, um, asynchronous serial, so UART interfaces on boards, uh, very easy to generate with pretty much any platform that exists nowadays. And it's a single, single line for each, you know, for a transmit line or for a receive line. So asynchronous means there's no additional clock. The timing is built into the signal. So the only other wrinkle is if we're capturing a, a signal, and if we don't know what the speed is, what the baud rate is, we will have to either brute force that or measure the signal to figure out what it is, or just you know, try the different settings in the terminal program or something like that. But this is all just standard, standard stuff. You'll see how easy it is to generate this. And here's, you know, here's what a, a UART asynchronous serial data stream looks like. Um, it's very repetitive, sort of multiples. The widths of the signals are multiples. So if you see something like that coming out of your receiver, say on TP5 or even earlier in the process, you go, oh, Cool, this is probably asynchronous. And you'll probably end up seeing data coming out of the USB interface anyway. This particular screenshot I have, uh, my oscilloscope has d digital decoding functionality. So this data stream actually corresponds to the bytes down here, Benjamin along the bottom. So that's sort of a convenient thing for testing. So for the different demos that I've done, I'll show you two here. There's more. There's more. Uh, demos with source code and everything um, on my website, which is linked to at the end. But this is basically all you have to do to send a secret message. This one here is from a PIC. 
uh, where I'm just setting up the oscillator, setting up the baud rate, and then just doing printf. But instead of printing printf to a console, it's printf to the pin that is the LED. Here's a little Arduino demo, just set up software serial, point to the LED pin, and just print the message. So it's like the easiest way to do encoding and data transmission uh, that seems to work totally fine. Here are the different stages. So if we're looking at you know, test point one, two, three along the way, uh, when we're looking at the voltage divider or resistor divider right at the front end of that photodiode, it's going to be a noisy signal. You're not really going to see anything because the, the voltage is so small within that. And not every signal is going to end up looking like this, but you can sort of see the process. Um, this is the after the first stage amplifier where some of the noise is gone. We still see a little bit of it, but it's like a very obvious, we're seeing some data there. And then the second stage output, we're sort of there, but there's a lot of like, you know, kind of noise on here. It's kind of drooping a little bit. But if you set your threshold somewhere up here, then everything's going to end up being nice and clean on the next stage. And this is the comparator output where also, again, using my oscilloscope. And then down here, you can actually see that I've received the message that I was sending on my test circuit. Now I'm receiving it with OpticSpy and, uh, and, and decoding it here, but then also I'd be able to decode it in a terminal program, which I'll show you in a second. So here's the signal. It says insert secret message here. So that's sort of the, the process. OK, so a few demos. Um, I have two of them that I'll show here. And actually, there's one video I'll show as well that was just a pain to set up. Um, but just to get an idea, this first one is a parallax electronic badge, which I used for the test procedure. When I sent these, these boards were manufactured by eTechNet in China. And I didn't want to have to do any of the testing myself. So I wrote a little test procedure that's on the website. I used this board that happens to have an infrared LED on it. It runs on a parallax propeller processor. I just wrote a little bit of code. And you can see on the screen, actually, you probably can't see on the screen, but it says sending. And then whatever secret message is what it's sending, secret message. So I could have that in the test procedure. And all the test people had to do once they did the board level test is just hold that up to the infrared LED and see if it was decoding. So you can't see it sending a secret message, but it is. Um, and even if you don't trust me, I'll show you that it's actually working. Uh, let's see how I do this. I think I have to share my screen. Yeah, so I'm going to quickly mirror the screen so you can see it. You see that now? Yes. OK, so now this is sending secret message. I'll just sort of hold this up. Am I at the right baud rate? No, <laughs> I'm not. That's at 9,600. So you'll see, you can still see date. You'll see that you're receiving something, but it's not the right thing. So switch that to 9,600. And now secret message. It's interesting that there's sort of some noise in between chunks of sending. So who knows? I'll blame it on fluorescent lights or something. Uh, let's see. I'll do one more, one more demo with um, a product called Tomu. And this is a tiny little USB device that has a little STM32 microcontroller on it, two LEDs. Actually, yeah, you guys should all have one in your boxes. Um, so we did that workshop two days ago um, using Tomu. And I actually have one plugged in already. And there's a little program that's available on the Tomu GitHub site called OpticSpy. It's, there's a pre-compiled version and there's source you can compile as well. Once you connect it in and connect up through screen or terminal program to Tomu, you can actually enter a message. So let's see. Um, hello, tear down. Enter the message. And now Tomu down on the, the Tomu device itself, the red LED just turned on. So it just looks like it's solid on. And actually, Tomu is transmitting at 19,200. So let's change that back. So yeah, hello, teardown. Now we should just be able to, hello, teardown. So now we're receiving the data that Tomu is sending um, through OpticSpy, which is this window, obviously. So yes, and lots of noise. I can move it closer. Now I'm like probably two inches away, and it's just sitting there. So you can see that you could like easily create some sort of optical interface. All right, let me get to my final few slides. Yeah, so there's the Tomu. 
Um, and then one that I did early on was uh, modifying a, a, a router. So Joe in his talk had talked about lots of devices that are running OpenWRT, DDWRT, different sort of open source platforms on Wi-Fi routers and stuff. And I thought this was really cool. Um, there'd been some security vulnerabilities with this device in the past. People have controlled the LEDs, but that's not the point. The point is that we could not only control the LED to turn on and off, but we're sending data with it. And we're not showing the security vulnerability of it, but we're showing what could happen if somebody has malicious access to a device and then wants to exfiltrate data. So it's just like another way to get people to think about different things you can do. Uh, this particular device was also mentioned in one of the papers that I referenced at the beginning, sort of talking about different ways of doing exfiltration. And what they were doing is sending bytes of data by changing eight, all eight LEDs to, you know, for eight bits. And I was like, well, that's sort of overkill and someone's going to see that. But if you just have the WAN light, which is normally on anyway, just, but now it's sending data, like that's a cooler way. So I don't know, this is, this is a little, my version of it. Um, I had to have administrator credentials for the demo, but you know, of course somebody could do that uh, if they, if they knew what they were doing to exploit a device. So this little demo is showing a screenshot of the little program that's running on the router that's saying exfiltrating data and it's, send, it's showing what it's exfiltrating. There's the light that's on, the WAN light, and you can't see it, can't see it doing anything. And I'm using a prototype of the optics spy here, but it's the you know, exact same circuitry. External USB to serial adapter instead of having it built on. Uh, because the light is sort of dim and I didn't physically modify the hardware, I had to hold the receiver right up to it. You could maybe adjust the gains to have it a little bit, you know, a little bit further away. But then here's the receiver section. We can see it's like there's a little bit of noise and now it's starting to do something. Speed it up a little bit and it's like, oh, look, it's dumping the, uh, the Etsy password file of that device over an LED to the optics buy. <laughs> so lots of stuff you could do with products, especially you know, if you can compromise them or whatever you want to do, get physical access, lots of fun things. And then, of course, you take it away and the data, data stops. So as sort of a summary, you know, with every product, there's going to be limitations. I say that tools, um, you know, tools are tools. Like you use them for certain things and they're not going to work for everything. A hammer is not going to work for everything. So you have different tools for different things. Um, I would say the main limitation of Optic Spy is that if the data is not NRZ encoded, if it's not from a UART interface, you can't use the, the FT231X. You can't use the USB to serial interface. Uh, so you have to use TP5 to look before it goes there. Not a huge deal, but somebody might go, oh, that's so annoying. I need another thing um, to see the data. But if you're you know, experimenting, you're going to have those tools around anyway. Receive range is short without optics. Um, and it's hard to determine the gain settings because they're tiny little potentiometers and they're multi-turn potentiometers. So you don't even know where it is here. It's like, you know, it can turn seven times or something. So you don't know where you are. It would be neat if there was some way to, to tell that. So you knew what your settings were between different devices. You can measure the resistance of each one, which is what I did during testing of like, oh, this thing works best with these settings. This one works with these, but it would be better to have something else. Um, and then, yeah, ideas of why you'd want to use this. Uh, covert channels, like I talked about, discovering things that exist, but then adding to your own, to your own projects. And then really just measuring the world around you, right? That's what sensors are for, is to see what's out there and sense things. And uh, I haven't spent a lot of time walking around with this, but I'm going to. And, I, and some people at the workshop were doing this, of just like pointing it at things and seeing what data do you get. If you don't get data, maybe you're just getting some other interesting waveform or something. And like, that's cool, right? It's like we have an extra eye that can see things that we can't see. That's what makes it fun. Uh, so yes, come into the light. Uh, if you want to build your own, everything's on the website. You can get bare boards from Oshpark. You can get assembled units from CrowdSupply. Uh, so lots of options, lots of ways to go. If you end up doing something cool with it, please let us know. Uh, we can post it in like a CrowdSupply update or um, you know, I can post code on my website, whatever, because this is all just to get people excited, right? And do something new. So that is it. Um, thank you for sitting here and, uh, and watching. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of Teardown. Do we have do we have any questions? Do we have time for questions? We do not have time for questions. Uh, but Joe's